the message is very direct as always, and a lot of times I make the message title long for a reason. This is not one of those times, but it does speak to you and I, and as always, I'd like for you to hear uh, the message before you judge the title. The name of the message today that the Lord has given me to share with you is called, Do You Recognize Your Enemy Yet? Do you recognize your enemy yet? Wednesday, I spoke to you about walking in victory by walking more in the Spirit, Holy Spirit, walking more in the Spirit of God than in the flesh. And I'm continuing, not as a second part, but in step with that message. Because you see, we as believers... And first of all, you have to be a believer to even begin to overcome uh, your enemy. That's just impossible otherwise. So you have to be a genuine believer. And it doesn't stop with that. It starts with that. Because after that, we have to learn how to walk more in the spirit and less in the flesh. And that is a lifelong journey. But still, it should never ever be minimized because that's the only way that you can understand what I'm going to say right now. And I shared that with the brothers and sisters Wednesday, and it's this. We cannot fight from a defeated place in our life to overcome. You say, Pastor, that doesn't make sense. Hear me. We are not fighting to overcome what's already been won for us. That's what I'm saying. We're fighting to walk in what's already been won for us. And that must come by walking in the spirit and not the flesh. So we are fighting from, if you're a genuine believer, we are fighting the battle from the place of victory, which is the cross. But you got to walk in the spirit because with truth be known, brothers and sisters, Everything about our lives is by the Spirit. The Bible actually says in Galatians 3, 3, you don't need to go there, but it says what has been started by the Spirit must be completed in the Spirit. So our overcoming life, our abundant life must be in the Spirit. The flesh that most people consider the flesh is not what I'm talking about, not what you can touch. That is a housing, that is a temple. But it is not the flesh that I'm talking about. When the Bible says in Galatians that if you walk in the flesh, you will die. He's talking to believers. So he's not talking about, because believe me, you know, I don't know of anybody here that can walk in the spirit and not move the flesh. Because we're housed in this body. But this is a body. This is not the flesh that Paul talks about. It's not the flesh. Listen. Your bodies, my bodies, are not inherently evil. You understand that? It is a body. The body is created good in the sight of God. It, it's not the body, the flesh, this, this body that we have that's evil. It is the man, the fallen nature that's evil. And that's what I want you to see. And that's when I talk about this. I want, just, I'm going to throw this at you. You know, when you think about it, you see, that's the same thing that David, the, the shepherd boy, fought the giant from. Was from, you say, well, not the cross, Pastor, but the covenant. And that's what the cross is. See, the New Testament is, the covenant of the New Testament was housed on the cross. It was shed, that was the altar of the New Testament, the shed blood of Christ. In the Old Testament, when David came against Goliath and the Philistines, which represents the flesh, he came against the flesh, not in flesh versus flesh, but he came against the, the flesh in the covenant of God. He said, you come against me with sword and spirit, but I come against you in the name of the Lord. I dare you, you uncircumcised giant, to taunt the, cir the circumcised Covet, coveted people of God. And he, and if you understand the type of shadow was, he was coming from the covenant of God made with God's people 
from a place of victory. That's why he can challenge and defeat Goliath. And I looked at that and I carried that over into the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 13. I'm giving you just some, some different things I want you to think about. When the twelve spies were commanded by Moses to go and to scout out the promised land. All of them were understood that they were under covenant with God. Right? But out of the twelve, ten came back. And they saw everything that Joshua and Caleb saw, but with a different set of eyes. And because they saw everything, they, everyone, I mean, they all saw the same thing. They touched, they feel, they smell. But Caleb and Joshua saw it from the covenant that God made with them. So when they said, let us go and take the land for we are well able, they were not talking about their flesh. They were talking about the covenant promise of God. So they were fighting. They wanted to fight and gain victory from the place of covenant. Now you and I, the Bible says that our covenant is not a physical covenant. It's not, we don't have circumcision of the flesh representing that of the religious covenant or the Mosaic covenant. We have a greater covenant with better promises because the covenant we have is the circumcision of our hearts. But we still have to overcome and we still must take victory and overcome the enemy from the position of victory. And that is by walking in the spirit and not the flesh. Amen? So again, the name of the message is titled do you recognize your enemy yet? Now, I know about this time, somebody in the back of their mind will say, well, Pastor, that's easy. It's the devil. And you're right in, up to a point. But to be truthful with you, the devil has to wait in line before he can touch you. You hear what I'm saying? The devil is your enemy, but he's not your greatest enemy. He has to wait in line. Before he can touch you, before he can get at you. As a covenant child of God. Let that sink in for a moment. He's got to wait in line. Open your Bibles, if you will, to Jeremiah chapter 18, verses uh, let's see, 1 to 12. Old Testament. Brother, did you get that mic turned on? Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 1 through 12. When you get there, say amen. amen. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Arise. That's an action on our part. And go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, a rock, a work on the wheels, or he was making or forging a work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again another vessel that seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Now it wasn't <clears throat> the word of the Lord came. To Jeremiah before telling him what to do and it was up to Jeremiah to obey that and arise to go and then it didn't stop there because when he went to where he needed to go he saw something and then once he saw something God explained what he had saw by his words then the word of the Lord came to me saying house of Israel cannot I do with you as this potter saith the Lord Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in mine hand, O house of Israel. At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it, if that nation against whom I have pronounced 
turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it. If it do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, then I repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. Now therefore go to speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I frame evil against you, and devise a device against you. Return you now every one from his evil way, and make your ways and your doings good. And you know what they answered him? This is what they said. These are people of God that are covenant people of God. They said, there is no hope, but we will walk after our own devices, and we will, everyone, do the imagination of his evil heart. And that's the word of the Lord. You say, well, Pastor, he's speaking to Israel, he's speaking to his people that had covenant. Old and new, the same thing. Father God, I just, I just thank you, Lord, and I, I ask that you continue to lead us by your holy word and the Holy Spirit into all truth. Lord, I pray that you keep us hungry and thirsty for your word throughout our journey by your grace and mercy. And everyone says, Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I got a second reading I want to introduce to you. Uh, and then we'll go right into the theme and to the text. Uh, the second reading is found in Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 through 25. Now, uh, it's primarily, primarily a review from Wednesday, that's this reading, but it also houses uh, uh, just houses the framework, if you will, to the text that I'm going to introduce you to. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 to 25, the first, very first verse in 13 says, For brethren, you have been called into liberty, only use not your liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but love and serve one another. Now if you turn to Galatians chapter 5, that's where I'm going to start the second reading, and I won't really start expounding on it until I get to our text, but starting with verse 13, are you all with me? The Bible says in verse 13 of chapter 5, it says, For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. But by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And we know that this cannot happen. And that's what happens first. That's right. The first commandment. To love the law with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. The second is as the first. To love thy neighbor as thyself. But you cannot do that until the first is in place. Amen. He says, But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. Right there it tells me that you're speaking about something. What you sow, you're going to reap. If you sow confusion, what are you going to reap? Confusion. If you sow uh, division, what are you going to reap? Division. If you sow strife, what are you going to reap? If you sow lies, what are you going to reap? Lies. Lie. So if you sow gossip, what are you going to reap? Lies. So you see, that is the standard from the very beginning of Genesis. After its own kind shall it produce our words. I'm not talking about just our words today. I'm talking about our lives. I'm talking about the greatest enemy we have. I'm talking about... Satan having to wait for something to happen before, and a believer, before he can even touch you or even come against you. See, when I ask you, have you re recognized your, your enemy yet? How many of you know who I'm talking about? You, me. That's your greatest enemy. That's right, the mind. Hey, listen. That is your greatest enemy. Because your mind regulates your will and your, your emotions. So you see, Satan can't even begin to, to 
uh, uh, overcome you as a covenant child of God unless first he has two doors open to him. The first door is the world. The second door is your flesh. That's the only way that he can attack you and have any, any victory whatsoever. Is if you compromise with the world. And if you compromise with the world, then your thinking becomes more in line with the world than it does with the covenant promises of God. And that's what he's waiting for. So I ask you, have you recognized your enemy yet? And don't point to your spouse, because it's not. Don't point to your boyfriend and your girlfriend, because it's not. Don't point to the devil, because it's not. It's you. That's why I tell you, that's why I tell myself that we need to walk more in the spirit than ever before. Because the greater the challenges, the more the intensity of times are coming upon us. I want you to know something. If you are having a hard time overcoming in the days of peace and the time of peace, how are you going to contend with the horses when the Jordan swells, so to speak? How are you going to contend when things rise up even greater? You can't contend in the flesh. I can, you can, but in the spirit, you've already got the victory. Amen. The Bible says here, this I say, verse 16, this I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now lust of the flesh is not just your great sins that we know about. It's anything contrary or many, anything that has anything to do with the me gospel or the I gospel. A lot of you are around my age or not too far past, but some of you remember Frank Sinatra. I'm sure, huh? Besides me. Anybody? One of his songs that he sang was, I did it my way. And that, my brothers, I hope he changed his tune. Because you see, unfortunately, that's what many believers are professing today. I believe it, I'm going to do it my way. But let me tell you, there's only one way, and that's to walk in the spirit and not the flesh. Amen. And the greatest enemy to you walking in the flesh is you. And it's me. I'm not your greatest enemy, you're your greatest enemy. You're the one that opens the door to the world or to Satan. As a covenant child, if you're in the world and not saved, I want you to know that you're already lost. The only place you can come is to the cross to start with. You've got to start there. You can't start with your own good works. How many of you know you can never ever do good enough things to offset the things that you've done bad or even thought about? You could never do that. You can never do good enough things to open up the key, open up the doors to heaven. It's only Christ that did and has. But that same spirit that raised up Jesus Christ, if it dwelleth in you, the Bible says, it will quicken your mortal bodies. That has to be a spirit-operated power. The Bible continues to say, for the flesh lusts against the spirit. Your flesh, for us to understand this even better, your mind, your emotions, or your soul man, let's put it that way, your soul man, which houses your mind, will, and emotions, it's not your spirit, it's, it's, the new, it's the new spirit in you, it's that new mindset, it's that mindset, a lot of times we're born again in the spirit, but you still act very much sometimes in the old nature, is that right? Why is that? Because we're still walking more in the flesh than we are in the spirit. Does that minimize the, the need to do it? No, it maximizes it. As you live long enough, as you come into these latter times, even more pointed than ever, I want you to know your eyes should be focused more on walking more in the spirit than you have in the past. And the only way you do that as a believer is to surrender more to the spirit and deny the flesh more. Now, you see, that's the hard part for most of us. We don't mind walking in the spirit as long as we can gratify the flesh. And it doesn't work that way. How many of you know that the word of God says in Luke 9, 23, what he says is not an optional request. And it's not just for me or 
you, Brother Dennis, by you, Sister Dorothy, by you, Brother Jeff, it's for everyone who has declared Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. You know, he's not going to skip it because I'm a pastor or because you're an elder or a deacon, deacon or a deaconess. He's not going to skip that part, you know. If anything, that is more honed into you so you can be an example. One of my greatest of thoughts, and it's something I read, was the fact that when I was down and out, how many of you ever get down and out as a believer here? How many of you know that many times we're always complaining and grumbling and talking about how bad we feel and how, you know, things are just not right. I don't know what's going on with me. And you don't really understand that, you know, you say, I've been walking all this time and I'm still the same way. Nothing's changing. But I want you to know that every time you say that and the journey for the most part, if you were able to look back on your footsteps, you'll see many times only one set of footprints. And I promise you, it's not you that put them there. It's the Holy Spirit that has carried you through the, 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 the ugly times, the good times, the bad times as a believer. Because as a believer, you face all of those. But when you walk more in the Spirit, what I see is you'll find less of your footsteps and more of His. They'll just be deeper, meaning you're walking with Him. Amen. The Bible continues to say this. It says, for the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Well, I know that for a fact. But if you be led of the spirit, you are not under the law. Wow. Now, the works of the flesh are manifest. And again, how many of you know that what I'm talking about is not your body, right? You know, at one time, the Gnostics believe that the, the spirit, regardless if you're saved or not, was good. But the body in itself was all evil no matter what. So it didn't matter what your body did. It didn't matter what you did. That's very much like this doctrine that is, is passed on that, that uh, you can do what you want, live like you want, because grace covers it all. That's a lie. Amen. But it comes from that. It comes from heresy. Grace in the Bible is biblical. But it's God's kind of grace. That affords us and enables us to go to the throne of mercy to get all the help we need in times of trouble. It's not to allow you to stay in your your your, your Mari pen. It's not to allow you to be lasciviousness and, and, and do all the sins you want to say, well, I'm saved by grace and through faith. You tell that to God. You tell that to God when he asks what you did with the sacrifice he made for you on the cross. See what he's going to say about that. It says, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. You, you notice it starts off with these big things that might say, but I ain't, I ain't part of that. But then it gets down to everyday life. Because within your own framework, within your own home, within your own relationship, within the own body of Christ, you have heresies going on. But then on the body of Christ, you have sedition, to division, you have hatred, variances. God, if you notice that he, he puts it all into the same group, it's all works of the flesh. He doesn't stop there. And he says this, he says, envious, being people that are envying one another, murders, drunkenness, re revelings, and such like of the which I tell you before, as I've told you in the time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Speaking about a habitual lifestyle, we've all done these things in one degree or another. But if you're a believer, it should never ever have and can be, can be. A habitual lifestyle. You cannot choose to live that way and still claim Christ as your Lord and Savior. People say, well, I believe in God, so therefore, no matter what and how I live, I'm okay because I believe in God. Let me ask you something. In the book of James, it also says that the demons believe in God or the devils believe in God, but they tremble. 
So belief in God as being God is not enough. Because even the devils believe that. Even Satan knows that. But they have enough knowledge to tremble before God. The Bible continues and says this. And I love the way it says that he comes right back and said, all these sayings are works. But he doesn't leave a negative, heavy weight on us, Sister Sidney. He gives us hope because we're born again believers. Can I hear amen? amen? Hallelujah. And it's because of his grace through faith, right? But there is a, a new spirit in us. In the book of Ezekiel, it says that Jesus, that the Lord God would give us a new spirit. Right? And a what? New heart. When you're born again, that's what happens. But it doesn't automatically renew your mind to that new spirit in you. In fact, most of the time, in fact, none of the time does it automatically do that. Most of us are getting used to the fact that our, our, uh, our cell phones and our watches automatically renew itself or reboot itself or bring in new apps or whatever it does. But the Holy Spirit doesn't automatically do that. He enables us to do that Especially when we realize that we need to do that more than ever when we see things, challenges that are coming up that are bigger than what they were yesterday. And you know what I find out about that in myself? I find that the challenges that are bigger than yesterday, five years ago or two months ago even, it's not that in, in size they're bigger, but in intensity yes. they are. Anybody understand what I'm saying? Yes. It's more of a constant thing. Boom, boom. Yes. And, and it's constant. It's kind of like when, when I laugh at my wife's uh, fairly new washing machine because it's different. It doesn't have an agitator, it just has a spin, you know? And I'm used to the old agitator, doom, 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 you know? But that spin, it makes, it sounds like a little Volkswagen taking off, oh, 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 you know, all these kind of sounds. And I think about that, I said, is that what the Holy Spirit's trying to do? He he's wants us to get off of this old agitating thing. You know, we wait for the different cycles to go about. And he said, no, I'm putting you in the high gear. When that new washing machine starts spinning, man, it, the cycles, I believe that's what's going to happen to us spiritually when we put our foot to the pedal. Amen. The Bible continues to say this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. Joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. When there's the works involved, you are under the law. That's including sin. When you are living under the, under the works of the law, then you are subject to the consequences that the law has placed in that. When you're living more in the spirit, then you're no law. And how does that happen? Is it something you just gain overnight? No. But it's something you need to want. You need to cultivate it. And you need to see the difference between where you are and where God wants you to be. And you need to understand something. That he's given us everything that we need to get exactly where he wants us to be. And we're going to need to be where we need to be. And exactly where he wants us to be. When all these things start coming down even faster than they are now. When we see things are rising up, you want to say, well, people, well, Pastor, I'm a studier of, uh, uh, of the end time prophecies and this and that. Well, I don't believe that you can do much with the end time prophecies if you're not dealing with your present tense war. To me, it's a common sense equation. The Bible says here, but the fruit of the Spirit, joy, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ, does it have an exception here, anybody? Yeah. The Lord, verse up here, does it have an exception? Well, because you're Brother Kevin, you don't have to do this. Because you're Sister Brandy, you don't have to do this. You don't worry about it. You know, you don't have to do this. But the Bible says that those whom are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Well, not me. I'm, a, I'm an elder. I'm bypassing that. Well, not me. I'm a deacon and stuff. Well, not me. I'm a, I'm a wannabe whatever. No. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, there's no exception there. 
Is it a, an everyday journey? Oh, yeah, it is. Why? Because with every step we take, and with every breath we breathe, and every heartbeat we have, it's a gift, an opportunity, a privilege. But you still got to make a choice how you spend that heartbeat, how you spend that, that breath of fresh air, how you spend those thoughts that he's given you. You understand what I'm saying? You will in a moment. It says, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with their affections and lust. If we live in the Spirit, verse 25, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Our text is found in the next chapter, chapter 6 of Galatians. An old verse we say over and over again, but I don't think it's, it has an impact on our lives. Because if it did, uh, then I think we'd be doing more in the spirit and less in the flesh. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 through 9, that is your text for today. Galatians 6, verses 7 through 9. The Bible says, Be not deceived. Are you all with me? God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Verse 8. For he that soweth to his flesh. Now what is the flesh? Is it our body? No. It's the mind. And we just read what the works of the flesh is. You know, we can remove adultery and fornication if you are free from that. I pray that you are. But there's a lot of other things that go up underneath there. And there's a lot of other things that are not listed there that you know are totally and completely against the Word of God. You don't have to have it written down to know. You know, I know. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh, the gratification, the flesh, the song that Frank Sinatra sang, I will do it my way. That's what he's talking about. Shall of the flesh reap corruption. Whatever is sown is reciprocated, is received. But he, and then he gives you the, the counter, uh, if you will, anti or, or position of victory that God gives us over, the, over this assignment, over this thing of our flesh. He gives us the solution to that. He says, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Now, what is that, Pastor? What, what do you mean? Well, when you sow to the Spirit, it's talking about the fruit of the Spirit. Remember, the fruit of the Spirit is not something that you make happen. It's not something that, that uh, you work at. It's something that is worked in you. But the way that it can be worked in you, and the only way that it can be worked in you, is by seeking to be led and to walk in the Spirit. The characteristics of the Spirit are love. That's why hate can't, can't stand a chance. And you all find it very amazing how all these people in the world that claim to be believers hate everybody around them. They don't look like them, don't smell like them, don't sound like them. But they're all believers. Now how does that work? It don't work. How about joy? Peace? I don't see any of that. Oh, I've got peace, Pastor. And if you're not living in love and joy, that peace that you have is fabricated. It won't stand the test of time. Joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. Those are the things that we need to sow into. Those are the things that we need to feed. Those are all seeds that have been sown in you as a child of God, but they have to be watered. They have to be cultivated. And that does, and many times what has, has to happen is you've got to get in that garden of fruit of the Holy Spirit and start pulling out some weeds. The Bible continues to say in our text, it says in verse 9, And let us not be weary in well-doing. 
For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. That's your text. And the theme that I want to share with you today is this. We can't serve two masters. We can't serve self, which is our ego, and God. We can't serve two masters. We can't serve self, which is our ego, and God. The Bible says in Proverbs 15, 32, it says, The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. Church, as I talked about Wednesday night, I continue once again to drive home, hopefully, this basic truth, which according to the Word of God is not optional, but a foundational truth in our faith walk. We must walk and learn to walk more in the spirit than in the flesh. And this must be on purpose. Must be on purpose. Remember a few moments ago, I asked you about if Luke 9, 23 was optional? Is it optional for anyone? If you say it is, then, then I'm going to ask you to stay a while. Let me, let me help you examine your heart after service to see if you truly are the faith. Because it's not optional. It really is not. Jesus Christ didn't say, half of you can just do this, another half don't have to do that because this and that or whatever. No, he says, in fact, he says, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. This speaks of walking in the spirit, my brothers and sisters, as opposed to living for self and flesh. You see, a lot of people misinterpreted that many years ago and thought, well, you know, the flesh was bad in itself, but your body in itself is not bad. I mean, it, it's not inherently bad. It's not evil. It's, it's good. God's when He created the body of Adam, He said it is good. Right? So your body is not because you are of the came out of your mother's womb from the fallen nature, which we all did. The, the body in itself is not bad. Is it subject to the plagues of the world? Yes, it is. But when you come unto the Lord, you enter into a covenant promise which declares that you're not subject to the plagues of Egypt. But you've got to fight for that from the place of victory. Not from the place of, oh, I've got to get it, I've got to. No, the place of victory says on the cross that by his stripes you're healed. The place of victory on the cross says the chastisement of our peace is upon his shoulders. You don't, you don't try to get that. It's already been, been transferred transported, if you will, or transcended unto you as a believer. But you've got to work it out. You've got to work it out. And you can't work it out if you're living in the flesh. The mind won't accept that. The mind doesn't want it to deny itself. And when you do deny itself, it causes you to have a, a religious bondage upon you. Where you think, well, my flesh is bad, so you know I, I, I need not to, to uh, feed myself right or clothe myself right. No, that's a bunch of garbage, and that's heresy. Way back when, the, the Catholics, uh, bishops and all them, when they, when they sinned or whatever, they would go into the room and they would beat themselves like if their flesh needed to be whipped. It wasn't their flesh that needed to be whipped. It was their mind that needed to be transformed. They needed salvation. You can beat your flesh all you want and it's still going to be only your flesh but it's going to be bruised up. It's got to be more than that. Did anybody hear me at all? You see, we are covenant. Say it with me. I'm a covenant child of God. I fight for the victory from the position of victory. Not from defeat, not from not from defeat, but from victory, victory of the cross. And that cross has to be worked in us. And that's something that you and I do individually and collectively. That's why I can tell you I'm so excited about every day that God gives me. But I've come to a point that I'm not only excited, Sister Victoria, about the days God gives me, I'm excited about the breath He gives me. I'm excited about the heartbeat He gives me. I'm excited about the opportunity He gives me. Because everything in a day is like a penny. You need a penny to add up to a dollar, right? Well, every breath and every heartbeat does the same thing concerning a life. Amen. So 
Don't ask me to repeat that. <laughs> Appreciate you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. It was spoken by the Spirit, so you have to receive it by the Spirit. Amen? Amen. In our second reading, Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17, we read, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to the ones to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Again, this speaks about an ongoing battle while we're here on this journey. Folks, if you've ever, I, I mean, all of us are at, regardless of how old you are, we all played it one time or another. Even when we used to have fellowships, uh, even before that, we played this game called Tug of War. Uh, I mean, I don't know if y'all remember that in school, but many of you, even as kids, you know, Tug of War. And you know, that that is a good, clean game, but there's a, a spiritual uh, place I want to take you with on there. When a group of people like us, Spiritually speaking, are on one side pulling against the other side. We're talking about pulling against our flesh. Fighting against our flesh. You got a tug of war. Your flesh, you know, back in the cartoon days when they had decent cartoons, they used to have a, they would show you a little red devil, and they're not calling him decent, but he was red, and red tights and a little pitchfork with a little horn, and he was on one side, and you had that little angel or whisper to you on this side. Well, you know, that was really a cartoonist in what you were statement, but it speaks volumes. Because one was on each side, they were not both on the same side. They were pulling you in two different directions. When you're pulling against, when even in a tug of war game, that's exactly what you're doing. But I want you to visualize you pulling against yourself. Your old nature. And the problem is, you know when people usually won in the tug of, tug of war, Sister Love back there? It's not that one was stronger than the other necessarily, but when the stronger group didn't pay attention, then the rhythm and the, the intensity of their stance is broken. And you can yank them off balance real easy. Well, that's what Satan is doing. That's what your old nature, he's waiting for your old nature to be fed more than you knew so that the fruit of the Spirit are, if you will, hindered because people allowed some little weeds to come in there. And after a while, they started to strangle out the covenant promises of God, not because they were removed, but because you don't see them anymore. A lot of times, when you don't take care of the garden, the, the weeds come up, and even though there's fruit there, it's, about, it's undernourished, and a lot of times you don't even see it. And because you don't see it, you don't tend to it. You see, what you feed the most definitely will be the strongest. You see, neither side wants to give way to the other. The new man doesn't want to give way to the old. Both want to be winners. But somebody will lose. Christ can't lose. But you and I can if we no longer are operating from a place of victory. If you no longer remember who you are, if you're operating more in the flesh, the more that you are in the flesh, the more that you are in your own nature. How many of you know that your old thoughts beget old thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You, can't, you can't say, well, you know, I'm just going to think about this one part of this, and but it, it opens up doors to about 15 other things. Insufficiencies, inadequacies, double-mindedness, anxiety, fear, on top of fear. You name it. Oh, respect to God. My watch is old, so I've got to tap it down hard. What I want you to understand is you and I are covenant people of God. But with the covenant promises of God, you have to understand where you start walking from or in victory is in the spirit. And the greatest enemy you have, no matter what, is your own mind, your own thoughts. Again, don't let the let people lie to you and say, well, you know, you, uh, you know, as long as you're, you're, you know, you receive God by faith and profess your, your mouth and belief in your heart, you're okay. Because there's more to it than that. 
There is feet attached to that. There is cultivating attached to that. There's watering attached to that. There's coming to church attached to that. Watering is part of that. Faith, uh, touching one another's faith is, is, is part of that. Cultivating is reading the Word of God, the, rightly dividing the truth. Pray. And like we, we just reminded ourselves, my wife reminded and herself as well as myself, a lot of times we forget, you know, that, that God is speaking to you to fast. Oh no, that's not God speaking to me. <laughs> but the thing is this, you're fighting the same old battle over and over again, and, and you say, what, what, what's going on here? Sometimes, you need to understand, again, fasting is not about, not about making God move on your behalf. You can't, you can't bargain with God. But what it is about is getting your flesh out of the way, bringing your flesh to submission so your spirit man can receive the things of God and bring that, that flesh into discipline. As genuine believers, we're thankful for the cross of Christ. It's only through the blood of Christ that we have accepted that we are saved. And by the work of the Holy Spirit that we are being sanctified as we walk with Him and in Him. But it's our responsibility to choose daily to do so as believers. You know, brothers and sisters, I've said it before and I'll say it again. A lot of times when we come into the Lord at first, when we first come to the Lord, there's nothing that's impossible with God in our lives. We just reach and grab it and no matter what anybody says. But as we walk with the Lord after a while, we seem to uh, kind of think that we're more mature now. We don't have to believe in the depth and embrace the Word of God as we did before. How foolish can you be? What was started in the Spirit must be completed in the Spirit. Yeah. Yeah. It's our responsibility to choose daily as believers. To walk in the spirit. But despite all that. We are still in the flesh. If you're not careful. See we're not glorified yet. And you need to understand that Your body is not glorified yet. You're in the road of sanctification. If you're a genuine believer. You're past sins. The blood of Christ is atonement for that. And it is what they call justification. But now you have the walk of sanctification. And a lot of people want to say, well, with justification comes sanctification. No, it doesn't. Sanctification is a walk. It's a journey where the Lord, the Holy Spirit continues to work out in you something that needs to be worked out. Your flesh, your old mind, your old will, your, your old emotions. And glory, just like sanctification is not completed on the cross, it's done on the walk. Just like glorification for your body is not done on the cross, it's done when you leave here. But it's all still the work of the cross. All of it. You can't add to it. That's why we're called to walk in the spirit more than in the flesh. Because you're a covenant child. You're not, as the Bible says, the mere end of Galatians, you don't have to go there, but read the whole chapter. Galatians 3, well, it says that. It says, with the miracles of God. Did they come by the law or by faith? They came by faith, not the law. In, in other words, it's all spirit. You know, it, it manifests, it benefits our flesh, but it's got to be worked in to, in order to be worked out. That's why it's so important for you and I to understand. And you've got to get this in your head. If you are genuinely a blood-bought child of God, then your victories come from the place of victory. Because he's the one that defeated the enemy. And his life is now in you, according to Galatians 2.20. So if his life is in you, now the life you live, you live because of the grace of God in you. That means that victory comes by walking in the Spirit. Because it's the Spirit that houses the new nature. We need to understand that we can be overcome by our flesh, if you're not careful. I believe the deeper the wash, the deeper the clean. That's all there is to it. Amen. You know, 
I'm kind of simple when it comes to that. I know that sometimes, even my wife, and some of the clothes, because I get so dirty sometimes, they need to be washed more than once. Sometimes, that's what happens in our lives. Some of the things that we think we're clean, we're clean of, it seems like they keep coming back. It's because we have not allowed them to go through the deep wash. We need to understand that we can be overcome by the flesh if we're not careful. Though many backsliders are blamed, and they blame the devil, the, the devil gets God into me. Well, the devil can't get into you as a believer unless you open the doors. Compromise with the world and walk in your, in your flesh. And again, let me, let me say this. A lot of you right now may be saying, well, you know, I'm not an adulterer. I'm not a fornicator. I'm not a drunkard. I'm not that, that, that. And that's fine. But what about the rest of it? What about when God has called you a covenant child, a, vic a child of victory, and you allow your, the I did it my way mentality to come up there. You know, the Word of God says that if it's not a faith, then it's a sin. What you do, if it's not a faith, it's a sin. You know the Word of God says that. Well, Pastor, how can it say that? Because you're a child of faith. You're a child of promise. I'm not making that up. You can find that in the Word of God. I don't make anything up. Why? Because God, God's going to hold me and keep me right there. He's going to say, why did you say that? I say, Lord, I, I preached your word, the whole counsel of it. And that, my brothers and sisters, is what I stand on. Amen? Amen? We need to understand that we can, we can be overcome by allowing our ego, our will, and our emotions. Again, I did it my way attitude. This happens when a believer relaxes from striving to walk in the spirit and lets the flesh take over. So who wins? Who wins for a believer who allows the flesh to take over? The flesh. The devil will always, always come in when you open the door. We do not like to think about it, Sister Flo, that the flesh can be considered the winner. But it does happen. And hopefully only temporarily. You know, our, our bodies as genuine believers are the temples of the Holy Spirit. A place where the Spirit dwells. That's what 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 through 20 says. But if we yield to the flesh, we know what is going to happen. A lot of believers don't believe this. If you live in the flesh, and, you, and I'm talking about a habitual lifestyle. I'm not talking about if, if you sin, because we all sin. Then the Holy Spirit's going to pack his bags and leave. No, he's going to convict you. He's going to chastise you first. Amen. That's his love. I will tell you this. If you choose to live in a habitual lifestyle that is contrary to the word of God, the Holy Spirit won't stay there. He will not. He will not share your body, his temple, with the world. It just doesn't work that way. So if you choose to live in a habitual lifestyle of sin without repentance, the Holy Spirit is not going to be there. Well, is there, is there anything that you can show me? Well, the Bible says that. Also, the Bible says that, you know, the whole, that we are not our own anymore, right? We're own, right? Well, what about Samson, Sister Cindy? What happened to Samson? Did the Holy Spirit depart from him? Yeah. Did he? It was bad about that. He didn't even know. How about, who was it, um, Eli? Where his sons got killed and at the, the, the tabernacle of God and he didn't even know. And when the tabernacle of God was taken to the Philistine camp, what happened? He had his, one of his children, one of his daughter-in-laws had a child, right? And because the presence of, and that's what it referred to, the presence of God was removed from Israel because of Eli and his, his family's uh, uh, fleshly uh, lifestyle, that the child that was born to his daughter-in-law after his sons were killed was named Ichabod. Why? Because the Spirit of the Lord has departed from us. 
Not maybe a little one, but it can move. It's important to know that. Brothers and sisters, the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to another, as Galatians 5, 17 says. In other words, there's no agree <coughs> agreement between the flesh, the old soul man, and the spirit, the new man. Our human nature and the Holy Spirit have desires and yearnings that are contrary to one another, Sister Willoughby. Our old flesh, is, our old nature is contrary to the Word of God. And we need to be very aware of that. Isn't that what David, King David, found out when he looked upon Bathsheba? That he fed his flesh and what happened? He fell. And he was a man after God's own heart. He not only fell in lust, but he fell into the doors that opened up to that murder. So it didn't stop when one door opened. And then he tried to justify it. Like some people do today in the house of God. There are believers that say, well, I'm under grace. Well, David said this. Then. No, I didn't do nothing. I'm going to marry her now and make it all right. <laughs> the root of the problem was not the lust of Bathsheba. It was the fact that that according to the word of God, he was staying at home when he should have been out pouring as other kings were. But the Bible said. David said in Psalms 51, verses 10 and 11, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not the Holy Spirit from me. That is Psalms 51, verses 10 and 11. Church, in order for us to see and personally know the two sides that are at war, we can't be looking at circumstances, situations, or other people. We need to examine our actions along with our motives to see the problem. We need to look at the flesh side and the spirit side. The flesh has its works and the spirit has its fruits. You can't get away from that. The flesh works, causes things to happen. The fruit of the Spirit happens because of who you're attached to. We need only to examine our actions along with our motives. We need to look at the flesh side and the Spirit side. As I said, the flesh has its works and the Spirit has its fruits. And these two are fighting against each other. The Bible says that over and over again. They lust against each other. They fight against each other. They're contrary to one another. And we know that both of these natures are in us right now. The flesh has its works. Neither can the flesh, nor hear me well, nor the spirit agree. Neither can they unless one serve the other. And I know the Holy Spirit will never serve our flesh as our whole nature will never serve the spirit. The Bible says many things, and I believe that everything that the Bible says speaks about our lives today relatively. In today's crisis, in today's situation, today's home lives, today's business lives, and I think more than ever, the biggest difference between the Old Testament and the New is because we've been given so much more as a New Testament believer as compared to an Old Testament believer. The Bible well says in the book of Hebrews that we've been given a better testament, a better covenant with better promises. Meaning that because we have, we have the Spirit indwelling in us. And I've said it before, a lot of people may not like to receive this. But when you're born again, you know that the Spirit of the Holy Spirit is indwelling in you. But it does not mean that you're being empowered by the Holy Spirit. Because that comes with surrender. That comes with, uh, people say, well, once you receive the Lord, you're automatically empowered by the Holy Spirit. That's not true. There has to be a baptism of fire, even when Jesus Christ bringing upon the disciples, the apostles, in the upper room the day after his, his crucifixion, he, he breathed on them, he said, receive ye the Holy Spirit. But it wasn't then that they received power. It was when they went to the upper room. 
He says, wait and tarry for the promise. You will be endued with power to go out and do some things. And then even with that, a little bit later on in the book of Acts, it says that when Peter and John, I think it was, were put in, in prison for preaching what they were preaching, that they were told not to preach in the name of Jesus because they would be beat and all this other stuff. And they were released and they were told, said, whether you like it or not, I'm paraphrasing, that we're going to preach Jesus. And they went to the other brethren that are like-minded, the Bible says. And they came together as they did in the upper room and prayed that the Lord God would give them courage and empower them. And a whole new shaking went about so that you know that it's never enough to be empowered or infilled with the power of the Holy Spirit at one time. It needs to be a continuous thing, a flowing thing. That's what the fruit of the Spirit do. They keep you in a place of reception. They keep you in a place of humility. They keep you in a place contrary to an ego trip where you're always seeking God. You're always seeking His face and not His hand. You realize that there's a battle going on inside you. And you're tired of playing second fiddle to that battle. You want to know that you are an overcomer. And the only way you can do that is by walking in the Spirit more, not less. You have heard the story of the old Native American and his grandson, and if you haven't, let me share with you again once more that you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about. This old Native American grandson, he was talking with his grandchild, and he said, Grandson, there are two wolves living inside you. They are fighting with one another. He said, one is filled with hatred, Pride, self-centeredness, and cruelty. The other is filled with love and peace and harmony and goodwill. The grandson asked, Grandfather, which one will win? The reply came, whichever one you feed the most. And I, I don't think that changes. In fact, I know it doesn't. Again, the Bible says in our text, be not deceived, in Galatians 6, 7, be not deceived, God is not mocked, why is he not mocked? For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh, shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit, shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. The Bible also says in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 31 and 32, it says, if we judge ourselves by God's word, and his spirit, we can't be deceived. It says, for to examine your heart, you won't be deceived. And why is that so important? Because then you won't be judged with the world. There was a man sitting at a stoplight one morning. And there was a lady in front of him. And she was putting on, or she was refreshing her lipstick at a stop line in, in her mirror and when the and I'm not making a pun towards you ladies I'm just stating an illustration here and when the light changed she ignored the fact that it had turned green and just continued to do what she was doing and she sat there until the light turned red again <laughs> so the man behind her began screaming have you ever seen that some people just move yes. in the floor yes. I've seen that uh, no looking at anybody here <laughs> this I, I think it's so typical and, and it, it says so so much if you listen to it so the man behind her began screaming and beating on the steering wheel his expressions of disgust were interrupted by a policeman tapping on his window and against his protest of, of the policeman he says you can't arrest me for hollering in my car you can't. This is my own private space. You cannot arrest me. The officer ordered him into the back seat of his police car. After about two hours in a holding cell, the arresting officer advised him he was free to go. And the man on the way out, he said, I knew you couldn't arrest me for what I was yelling in my own car. You haven't heard the last of me yet. And the officer replied, he said, I didn't arrest you for shouting in your car. He said, I was directly behind you at the light. 
I saw you screaming and beating your steering wheel, and I said to myself, what a jerk. <laughs> but he said to myself, I said to myself, but there's nothing I can do to him but throw him a fit in his own car. But he said, then I noticed something. He said, I noticed the cross hanging from your rear, rear view mirror. He said, I noticed the bright yellow choose light license plate on your cover. And I noticed the Jesus is coming soon bumper sticker. And I thought to myself, he stole a car. <laughs> Your actions often idea who you are. Okay. The things we post for people to see don't, but our actions do. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, 17 through 24, it says, This I say therefore and testify unto the Lord that you henceforth walk, not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind. Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them. Because of the blindness of their hearts. I want to read to you that first verse again. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. That's the ego. That's your old nature. When you find yourself snapping at people for no rhyme or reason. When you find yourself speaking two different languages. I don't mean spirit of tongues. <laughs> From one heart, there's something wrong. You can't have salt water and fresh water from the same heart, but yet we do. You need to realize you need to salt, shut down one in order for the other to flow. And it's your choice. There's no believer on the face of this earth that came before, that is, and that will come, that does not have a choice to choose Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. <coughs> Without the choice, we have no salvation. It's not automatic. It's not for a special few. It is for everyone that believes, both to the Jew and the Gentile. It's a choice. But you must believe on Him who purchased that right. Jesus is Jesus Christ alone. Amen? The Bible continues to say, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lasciviousness, to work all and cleanliness and greediness with greediness. But then you have not so learned Christ. If so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conversation. The old man, meaning we have the power to do that. And that comes about by walking more in the spirit, Sister Janice, than in the flesh. It's our choice. If you're born again, you have that choice. If you're not, you don't. And just because you are born again doesn't mean that it comes easy. I believe that the, the deeper and the greater the calling, sometimes the harder it is to walk in the Spirit. But it is not an option. It is a must. Whether you are a gatekeeper, whether you cut the lawn or whether you sweep, sweep the floors or teach children or whether you're a pastor, it does not matter. The requirement is the same. That you take up your cross and deny yourself daily. If you want to follow after him. And I don't know about you, but my Bible says that the way, the truth, and the life is the only way into the kingdom of God. So that means you've got to follow him. And the only way you and I can follow him is in truth and spirit. The only way we can worship Him is how? In spirit and truth. The Holy Spirit leads us into all truth. And the truth is that you cannot have victory from a position of your flesh. It can only be from the position of victory by walking more in the spirit as a covenant child of God. The circumcision is no longer religion. It is of the heart. I said this, and I'm almost completed, not because I'm finished with my notes, but because I need to finish for your sakes. 
so that you don't lose the, the impact, hopefully, that this message is trying to make in your life as it's made in mine. It says that we are to be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you would put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Why? Because we can't serve two masters. We can't have two songs in our hearts. We can't have the, the Frank Sinatra song and the song of the Lord. It's one or the other. We can't have I did it my way because Jesus said it's my way. Amen. Not your way. The old self enslaved to sin has been crucified with Christ in our theology, according to Romans 6, 6. But I've also found that theology is fine, but it doesn't work unless you wear it. Because the proof must be found in the pudding to be reality. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit, is what Galatians 5, 25 says. And last but not least, the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 17, it says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be holy in all manner of conduct, conversation. And that can only be when you walk in the Spirit. Because the flesh is, the old man is, the thoughts, no matter how well intended they can be, or may be, they are all tended by fallen motives. The me attitude first. The Bible says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning or traveling here in fear. Church, the spirit led life is a life of conflict. Because it is a constant combat with the old ways of the old nature, old thought, old ego, old soul that continue to tempt and seduce the believer to go back. And this struggle involves three enemies. The war against the Christian is not the devil. It's three enemies. It's the world the flesh, and then the devil. And the devil can only work through these first two areas of a believer. These are the doors that have to be opened to him. And in the believers, they are open from the inside to the outside. Not from the outside to the end, but from the inside to the outside. That's why the Bible says, give no place to the devil. And that's why Proverbs 23 says, Verse 7, part 8 says, For as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Many do believe, as I come to a close, that the devil is our greatest enemy. And by no means am I minimizing the fact that he is one of the greatest. But in order for him to have any power over a believer, it must come from the world that we compromise with, and through our own flesh, our mind, our will, and our emotions. The Word of God says that He is the Prince of the power of the air. And it says that He walks around as a roaring lion seeking to destroy believers. That's in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, and 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. And he does seek to devour. But in there, in verse 5, 8 of 1 Peter, it says he seeks to devour. It doesn't say that he devours, but he seeks to devour. He cannot overcome a believer that is standing against him and the world and their own flesh by in the position, standing in the place of covenant. You need to understand that covenant is in keeping. Is in keeping. 
And the only way that we as a believer can truly receive all that God has in for us is by walking in the Spirit. Because then and only then you'll not fulfill the desires of the flesh. Matthew 6.33 says, But seek ye the kingdom of God first, or first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness in all things shall be added unto you. Church, First John 2.16 warns us about the, verse, the, the three areas that Satan must get through, must be open to, in order to have any kind of effect on you as a believer. It says these three areas are in direct opposition to God. It's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It was in these three areas that Satan tempted Christ in the wilderness. So these are the areas that he will be tempting you and I over and over again. It says that he left Jesus for a season, meaning he would come back to tempt. So when you and I think that it's strange that we be tempted, or it's strange that fire and darts would come against us, or this or that, God is allowing certain things to happen in your life so that you'll walk more in the Spirit and less in the flesh. And if you're in a position that you're walking in the flesh more than the Spirit, God will also let His Word bear fruit in your life to whatever you sow to, you will reap. If you're in sin, if you're living in according to your flesh, even though you're a child of God, you will bear the fruit of the seed that you've sown, that you've sown, which is works, as compared to cultivating the seed of faith that bears the personality, the characteristics of the Holy Spirit. And remember this, it's not just spirit. The spirit that you and I have in us as a new man or a new woman is spirit, small s. But the spirit that indwells in us is the Holy Spirit, means Holy Spirit. That is who works with our new spirit so that we can renew our minds unto a new way of living, the newness of life. Would you bow your heads, please? Father God, I thank you, Lord, that, Father God, we will not walk after the flesh, but after the spirit. We will conform our thinking. We will transform our thinking by renewing our minds, Lord, and not conforming to the world, Father. Your word, Father God, has declared unto us that you, Lord God, and you alone, Holy Spirit, our spirit. And Jesus told his disciples, it is the spirit that quickeneth. In other words, it is the spirit that gives life. The flesh profiteth nothing. Nothing. But the words that I speak of you, they are spirit and they are life. In other words, Christ becomes raiment to us when we walk in the spirit. Every genuine believer, follower of Christ, has a spirit. But the spirit does not have every genuine Christian. Simply put, if you're a believer, you have all the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit demands to have all of you. And let me say in closing, without apology, this stern warning in chapter 5 of Galatians, verse 21, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. The word do refers to the habitual practice of such things. But I'll close on this final note. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who live after the Spirit and not the flesh. That's what the Word of God says. Let me impress upon you this. You have victory as a covenant child of God. I believe if you want to 
understand what that means. If you want to understand what that means from a place of victory that I'm talking about, from the place of the cross, then you can understand what Paul said in the Philippian church. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but how much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputing, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life. The word of life is of the Spirit. That's what quickens your mortal body. That's what Jesus spoke to his disciples when he says, flesh profited nothing. What I, the word that I give you, it quickens your spirit. It gives life to your spirit. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for your word. I pray, Lord God, that it finds a place in my brothers and sisters today, Lord. That they realize that they're covenant children of God. And that, Lord, they overcome by walking more in the Spirit, not less. And that they are not trying to overcome from a fallen state. And if they are from a fallen state, they'll never overcome. Because overcoming comes from the victory position of the cross. So therefore, the cross must be worked out in us. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It's not about adding to or adding on. It's about allowing the work of the cross to work in you. You buy your heads more. For all those who are watching or will be watching this message in the near future, I pray that you heard something that will cause you to be more hungry than you were yesterday. I pray that you press in to the things of God. Prove it for yourself. Right from the divine, the word of God, the word of truth. And when you do that, the more your spirit will grow. The more that you will be not objected to the flesh, to fear and double-mindedness, or constant oppression, or to other strongholds of sinfulness. But you will become an overcomer. And not only Satan, but the world in your own flesh. I think when you do that, Brother Kevin, when we do that, then we truly recognize our enemy. So, Father God, I ask that you help us as we overcome the enemy on all three battlefronts. And I know, Lord, that there's nothing more than that which says, yes, Lord, amen, than when we walk in agreement with spirit, soul, and body. I bid each and every one of you a blessed day and afternoon, and I thank you for being here with me. I thank you for the support you have for me as your pastor, and I thank you for the love that you have for me as your pastor. And because of that, I'll leave you with the blessing that God told Moses, uh, what they call the Arianic blessing. It says this, May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. May the Lord lift up his confidence upon you and give you peace. I speak that to each and every one of you. And pray that you be a mirror image of all that you heard today. God be all the glory. And everyone says, Amen. God bless you.